Okay, so here we are live. Well, we'll just give everyone a few minutes to trickle in here. But I'm really looking forward to today's show. I've got Todd and Steve with me. And we're going hello. to be doing, hey talking about, hello. <laughs> we're going to be talking through not our entire watch collections because uh, uh, Todd and Steve would probably it would be like a six hour live stream for your guys' uh, <laughs> collections. Um, which would be, it would be cool that like a, a watch marathon. My, Everyone uh, would fall asleep by I think hour two. Yeah. I could show you all the ones that aren't running. So that would be so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the, yeah, the the, uh, the reverse, um, and um, so what we've just picked five. So if you're watching this, we'll, we've got five each, and we're going to basically alternate between mm -hmm. the different ones. And then what we'll do for everyone that's watching this live, welcome. We'll take some questions as well. So if you have any questions about any of the watches that you see, let us know because I think that'd be quite interesting and thanks for everyone that's uh, been commenting over the last couple mm -hmm. of weeks last week i did make a mistake i got the date wrong but it was so it was so so good that one last week that vintage one did you guys enjoy it yeah absolutely oh yeah that was a lot of fun i learned a lot too and having um dave on from detroit mint and uh, uh you know from hamilton it was great yeah josh yeah josh yeah and yeah. Yeah, really it was good. really cool uh, getting to, I mean, I, I told you offline, Sam, that I think, you know, Josh's insight is really valuable as well. Cause you know, I think it's, I always love to talk to watchmakers uh, personally, um, mm -hmm. just to kind of mm -hmm. understand, you know, tell me about what kind of watches you've gotten in or, you know, what, what you're working on at the moment, or, um, you know, if there are any um, particular models I should keep a lookout for. So mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I always love to talk to those guys and pick their brains. Yep. Most of the time they don't kick me out when I do that. So, <laughs> Yeah, it was it was an eye opener for me about Hamilton and then the Seiko Todd that it's not buying vintage is not as scary as you might think with those. Certainly, I didn't realize that Hamilton parts were readily available. It sounds like some of the vintage mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, usually it's usually it's a uh, certain models that were run for a short period of time, or may have had a unique movement, or like uh, like we were talking about in terms of the electronic uh, watches. Some mm -hmm. of those are very very difficult to find parts for. I've got a um, electronic Bucherer sitting on my my watch bench that I'm going to start playing with at some point to see if I get running. I have an elect I have an electric uh, Seiko. And those you can still find enough of them to get spare parts. And I made I, I took three and made one work, but now I need to. Um, but the going train needs to be lubricated and, and redone. So that part I haven't quite um, been up to uh, trying to disassemble yet. That's my next my next experiment at some point. Awesome. We've got people trickling in now. We might as well start. We won't do a wristwatch check this week, guys, because obviously we're going to be going through our collections. Who who'd like to kick us off? Who wants to go first on there with the first watch? Todd, I think you should. I guess go I first. can since since we're all so eager to jump in. <laughs> Excuse yeah, me, absolutely. I did a I just did just got done with a run short time ago, so I'm still rehydrating. Okay, so the first one. Uh, that you want to bring up, uh, if you have the pictures, Sam, you want to bring up is the is the Carl F. Booker, um, which is yeah, this one right uh, here. Let me, ooh, there let me pull that up. Whoop, that's the wrong one. That's so not it. This is the this is the. No, that's not, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, that's the Carl F. Booker. Um, so this is a uh, this is their uh, 2018. Heritage by Compact's Chronograph annual calendar. So this is an annual calendar. It only needs to be, if you were to actually, you know, wear it continuously, would only need to be uh, corrected once a year uh, for February because it doesn't have the ability to account for February as a shorter uh, month, and it doesn't do leap years, of course. Uh, so you would need a perpetual calendar in order to uh, get, get that. But it's really neat. It's um, uh, I've got it. Whoops, it's one right here. It's uh. Built on a ETA, so some, you know, some of the watch people might get a little, they get a little huffy. Well, wait, it's based on an ETA caliber with a Dewey de Poix module on top, which so it has the annual calendar module and the chronograph 
module on top of it. It's got, uh, I'm gonna look over my glasses here because I always have to be able to do it. Um, it has, I think it's 54 jewels. It's got an immense oh, amount wow. of jeweling because it needs to, you know, you know, for both the annual calendar and for the, um, I'm looking for it here. Do I even have it? I can't find it right off. It's in gold. It's in like gold, gold uh, lettering on the mechanism. Uh, and it's just hard in this light to, to kind of get it. But this is the, um, I can hold it up here. Hold on a second. got to take apart this. So you can see the, I didn't take a picture of it, but, and you're not going to, it's not going to come through very well, is it? No, there it is. But it has their, so it has their characteristic, um, it's actually a tourbillon. So the Karl F. Bucherer symbol, which looks like um, multiple waves going across, uh, that their symbol is, is a, um, is a, a tourbillon. Let me try this one more time. And so they have that designed as part of the rotor. This does not have the peripheral rotor system that Karl F. Bucherer is one of the few watch companies or watch manufacturers that will actually do a peripheral rotor. Um, but, um, it's a really, it's a really neat movement. There's a lot of horological history to Dupuy Dupois, who also were involved in the first automatic chronograph back in the 1960s, uh, automatic chronograph race. Uh, and they were part of the Hamilton, uh, or were they part of the caliber 11 group? I got to think for a moment. Um, I think the caliber 11 group now that I mention it, um, I've forgotten, but anyhow, the, uh, you know, there's a long history here. Uh, it keeps excellent time. This is, um, mine is number 377 out of 888. And uh, it's just a neat, uh, you know, I, I, this is one of the ones I got from Dean Bump from Little Switzerland. And it's just interesting to actually have this much of it. So the reason I brought this on is because this is the most complications of anything in my collection. And uh, it's just a, uh, yeah. just a really neat piece of horology. And of course, like you did the interview with Dean Bump, the contributions that Bucherer did with, uh, for Rolex and, 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 and Wilsdorf, yeah. Hans Wilsdorf and how they worked together early on and their history back and forth is really interesting. So, um, that's my first, uh, first go at it here. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. Yeah. Let us know as we go through this, guys, if you've got any questions. So that was that was the first one. Mm -hmm. Let me just remove this. So do, do you want to go next, Steve, or do you want me to go sure. next? Sure. So <clears throat> I think my first watch here is going to be a Zodiac SST mm. uh, Seawolf 36,000. Um, and I guess the reason why I picked this one is just because it's probably the weirdest watch in my collection. It's probably the weirdest watch I've ever mm -hmm. owned. Um, it's you know, cool. Th this whole, this whole watch is just, is just oozing quirk and charm. Uh, and you know, I, I think the thing that immediately sticks out is the fact that it's got this kind of coffin head, uh, uh, coffin shaped case. Mm -hmm. It's a, it is a bull head. So it's got, it's got two, uh, crowns up at the very top of the case that you can see in the picture there. One of them controls an inner bezel. And then the other one, uh, you know, controls like the, the date function. Um, and it also has like a press in quick set date, uh, which is similar to uh, some of the Seiko watches from the similar era, which I would say would be like the early to, to mid 1970s. Um, I guess some of the other things that I, I really like about it is that, it, and I think I, I did take one picture of this here, but it's got these really weird raised like plastic trapezoidal indices that the second hand actually passes underneath and um you know i had never seen one of these before i got this one i actually got this in parts uh about three or four months ago and and sent it all in parts to this guy in canada who's a, a zodiac specialist and he put it all together and when i got it back i just couldn't believe it because it was just so weird looking the the second the the sweeping seconds hand kind of passes underneath these these plastic markers I'd never seen anything like that. Of course, it's got the the bright orange accents, including a bright orange uh, day and date wheel. And I mean, there's just there's just so much to look at here. I mean, I feel like I can never be bored looking at this watch. And so um, and that was one of the reasons why I picked this one is just because I don't have anything else in my collection that's quite like this. And uh, I always love weird and and unusual watches. And I think this one uh, is definitely one that I'm happy to own, and and hopefully will continue to own for a long time. Mm -hmm. Is that a so real? Are you saying that the? 30, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
Now, I was just going to say, are, the, are you saying that the indices are stuck to the underside of the crystal? They're not on the crystal. In, they're in actually, the so there, there is a picture, like if you go, I don't know, maybe one or two more down, you can kind of see it, but like they're raised, they're raised off of the dial, kind of uh, like the way that yeah. the, um, oh, the new yeah. of, uh, oceanographer models kind of have those raised plastic indices. So they're kind of like these trapezoidal indices and the, the, the sweep hand like passes underneath it. It's the weirdest thing ever. I mean, uh, obviously the watch has to be running right because otherwise it would interfere with those uh, indices. But yeah, the second hand passes underneath it. And I think also maybe the minute hand does as well. And I was just, I've never seen anything like that before. Very, very unusual design. Uh, mm, obviously Zodiac was just trying out some, some new things, also putting in a high beat movement and a diver. It's just a lot of weird stuff here going on here. And I just love everything about it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's a true 36,000 beat movement. It is. That's amazing. Is. Yeah. And the, and the, you know, the sweep is perfectly smooth as well. So, you know, it, it truly is a, a high beat movement. So yeah, really, really weird, really unusual. Nice. And How about uh, you, Sam? I always find this interesting. Yeah. I always <laughs> find this interesting because was the Zodiac Killer named after the watch, or was it? There yes. Was, was, didn't the Zodiac Killer actually wear a Zodiac watch? He did. Oh. He did. Yeah. So if you watch the movie, I think uh, you know the one that came out in 2006 or 2007 with Jake Gyllenhaal. I think one of the the characters in the movie actually does wear a Zodiac Seawolf, um, and it would have been you know an earlier model, like from the 1960s. But yes, they the Zodiac Killer used that same sort of crosshairs design that that zodiac uses for their watches mm -hmm. and so he used that on his um, yeah. i don't know ransom letters or or um i don't know threat letters or, <laughs> i don't know what you want to call yeah. them but yeah yeah because it was nothing to do with the because you think the zodiac you think it was the signs of the zodiac but it's to do with right. the watch which is an amazing is. bit of watch history i mean obviously they don't want to tout that they don't they, they, no. you know it's not uh there's no limited edition <laughs> serial killer version of course right. but um that's yeah, fascinating okay well let me um i'll show you my next so my first one here is and i'm gonna try a bit i've got a watch cam set up here the quality is not great so i've also got a web site as well that we can pull up the first one is my veya here so this is the us assembled veya d5 and this is what they call the uh, tropical dial it's it is not showing it now but it does have a roulette date wheel as well so the date will go red at certain periods but i love this uh, let me show you what it looks like on the actual their website so you can see there they've got the red roulette date wheel cool. i think veya is one of the most exciting US brands to of, of recent times, set up by Ryan and Reagan, two surfers. They kindly sent me this one after I did a review of it. And I've reviewed most of their watches. And I they, they, this was one of the few that I got to keep because I'm, I'm usually more than happy enough just to, to review them and send them on to another reviewer. But yeah, fantastic watch. The only thing I don't love about this is the metal bracelet that it came on. For me, it's just, I'm not like a huge fan of it. So I always keep it on a NATO. I think it looks pretty good. It looks awesome on a Tropic as well. Um, it's got a nice bezel action. The lugs on it, not that dissimilar from, reminds me of a Speedmaster. But mm -hmm. it's, a, it's mm -hmm. a diver there. That is really cool. Yeah. And I think yeah. I think uh, that model is based off of like the, is it the JLC C Alarm? Is that is that the model that, that it's similar yeah, to? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's similar. This dial is similar to a vintage uh, JLC. Yeah, you mm -hmm. spot on there. I think this one's five hundred dollars, which uh, for a US assembled watch, Veyer's uh, Ryan and Reagan's th uh, thing at Veyer is they would like to do as much as they can in mm -hmm. the US, in the US, so they get the right. straps made. And these watches, I believe, are made in Chicago, and I don't know whether it's. I've asked them this before, and I don't don't. I don't think they know whether it was like the old Elgin plant or one of those other um, Ohio based watch companies, but they have them assembled in Chicago. Now they used to assemble them by hand in LA actually, mm -hmm. but now they've got, oh. obviously the volumes got so big. There's a, they also do this version in a Swiss as well, which I believe has got an ETA movement in it. So you mm -hmm. can either opt with this Miota 
9015 or you can get the Swiss made. I mean, I the, of all the Miyota movements, I think the 9015 is re- a really good one. I wouldn't pick anything with the 8000 series these days, but mm-hmm. I quite like that one. That's really sharp. And somebody in the chat's wearing, uh, got a Veyer on. Oh. <laughs> there we go. It's a popular brand. I, I think um, in my watch club, I'm in the uh, Red Bar chapter for Austin, and I think we have like two or three people who also have theirs. So definitely one of these up and coming brands for sure. Kind of the way that, you know, like maybe Fair was a, a few years ago where, you know, you didn't see many fairs and then all of a sudden they're all over the place. <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. And this, the good thing with Veyer is they've got watches that start, uh, it quartz watches that start less than $200, I think. So if you want mm-hmm. that US made supporting a US brand, I think this is one of the disservices that Shinola did. They made people think that US assembled watches were brutally expensive for a quart, even for a quartz watch. Mm-hmm. And it's not true. I mean, if you look at mechanicals like Zal Baltimore, Alan at Zal Baltimore, they uh you know, dave at detroit mint there's a whole host of small mm-hmm. micro brands in the u.s that you can pick up very affordable prices yeah that's cool okay todd well do you want to do you want to kick us off with your your next one yeah let's do um let's do one that represents a journey um so this, huh? this is just a fun story around this uh this is so pull up the turtle if you would okay yeah absolutely you can see my go. little watch bench. Yeah, so this is kind of funny lighting on it. So this is the, now this is, you know, a ubiquitous uh, Seiko turtle. Um, this is from 2018, 2017 when it came out. But the story behind this is this is a limited edition Seiko, uh, which is not so surprising. Um, this is number 900 and I'm looking at 935 out of 2018. Yeah, so this is 2018. And they, this was a Europe-only release of this. And I just, when I first saw it come out and be advertised, and the picture doesn't quite do it really great justice, but it's really a terrific combination of color. It's just something, I, Seiko does silver dials exceptionally well. And the quality, if you can see it on it, it's um, it's just really neat from a sunburst perspective. And it's something about it just grabbed me. I've already, ha- I already had the uh, Patty, ubiquitous like Patty turtle. But anyhow, the point is that I, I was due to go on a business trip to Belgium anyway. And so uh, what I did, and my wife was going to come with me on this trip. And so I did is I started emailing a bunch of Belgian jewelers that were Seiko authorized outlets. And I found one that actually had one that was not already taken. So I said, hold on to it. I'll go and find it. And so we went from, it was in, um, in Bruges, Bruges, Belgium, which is like stepping back into the Middle Ages. It's just gorgeous. It's, uh, just it's stone, and there's um, different uh, uh, canals running around. And we did a canal tour while we were there, and we took the so we took the train out to to Bruges from Brussels, and it was just a terrific adventure. And we had such a great time, and uh, and I got there, and I took pictures, and and got the watch, and and so the story of the watch is, uh, it's just a neat watch. It's designed to represent, you know, Seiko always has a story behind their, their watches and the dials, especially like the snowflake, and you know, for Grand Seiko and what have you. And the story of this is, is um, uh, what, um, what, what it looks like at dawn across the water in a certain part of Japan. It's supposed to be reminiscent of what this. That's why it's called the Dawn Gray, and. So they did this, they did this in the samurai case and they did it in the turtle case. And I actually ended up finding the samurai version for a very good price. Not long ago. So I have both Don gray, uh, limited edition watches, but it's pretty cool. And, uh, it just, just reminds me of the time my wife and I had out there exploring that part of uh, Belgium, which I'd never been before. And just, you know, the destination to get the watch, but the part of the journey was what was really fun. So that that's the kind of, and hunting. I love hunting. And so it was great to actually find someone that said, yeah, yeah, we got one. So that's the story behind this one. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. The dials are something else. Yeah. The dials are something else on Seiko's, aren't they? It, 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 the mid range. I, I don't think there's many comparable watches that have yeah. the level it's, of detail. It's that hard to get the level there. of detail that they do. I mean, you can argue, you look at, but one thing beautiful about this is look at that. Everything's aligned beautifully. 
the chapter rings aligned and the bezels <laughs> and then Seiko gets a lot of flack and they should for not being able to do that consistently. Um, their sub brand Orient does a fantastic job of this and yet Seiko can't seem to get it right. But, uh, but yeah, but uh, no matter what happens, Seiko can do a dial just beautifully. We're getting a request to see the, the samurai. We, if, if we have time at the end, we might have to do a bonus. <laughs> I was just going to, to say, you know, this, this model, I, I think it's really smart that you got this, uh, not just because it's a good looking watch, but it seems like everyone now wants the SKX since mm -hmm. it's been discontinued. And a lot of people don't want to buy the new 5KX because it's right. not... It's not up to the same spec. It's not, as a, right, it's, not an, it's not an ISO diver. Like everyone's ignoring these new turtles, which makes no sense to me because, and, and I've, I've purchased one and I mean, they're awesome watches. Mm -hmm. They have a better movement. They have a screw down crown, you know, yep. um, it, they, they have the drilled lugs on them. I mean, they're, they're really great watches. And I feel like a lot of people are just totally passing them up because either they want the 5KX or they want the SKX, but I think the, the the new turtles are really awesome, and I mean, mm -hmm. there's so much variety out there with them. And yeah, there's a, uh, there's a bunch of variety. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say one other thing. I, I think it's really cool that you got that on on a trip. I mean, I I definitely do the same thing. Like when I go on vacation, I don't. I try not to relax. I actually like go out and look for watches because I'm a, I'm a total nerd like that. And I, I think it's always cool when you come back with a like you know some sort of like tangible memory you know and something mm -hmm. that you can wear and i'm sure you'll probably never never sell that just because of the memory that you had in, right. in acquiring that i don't sell watches well anyway it's just I, i'm a buy and hold guy and this is definitely one <laughs> that i have no interest to sell and it may actually appreciate value at some point not that that should be a primary or even a secondary objective for what we're doing but uh you're exactly right it'll the memory will always be there so i'm i'm just i just love it for that reason mm. cool Steve, do you want to go, go sure. next? What's your, your next well, one? Is it? I mean, it might be a good good transition because this is also a piece that has sentimental value for me as well. And uh, let's see, this is a Waltham Bath Escape uh, Diver. Um, so, you know, on the surface, this thing is, I don't know, maybe not all that interesting. It Actually, I take that back. It is it is cool because it is. it's a rebranded Blanc Pond. Uh, so Blanc Pond... Um, you know, in the 1960s, they were uh, selling their dive watches, but they weren't as well known in the U.S. as the Waltham brand was. And, and Waltham was a much better known brand. Waltham had already been bought out or gone into bankruptcy. And the, the parent company that owned Blanc Pond um, purchased the Waltham name and then they rebranded some of these Blanc Pond watches to sell in the United States. So that's kind of the interesting story behind this particular model. I mean, you look at it and I mean, it's you know, it's neat. And the fact that it's got the kind of the age loom and the, the, uh, um, the Bakelite crystal on it. But uh, really the, the, the big reason why I, I like it so much is because this was my dad's watch. He got this from um, his grandfather when he graduated high school in, uh, in 1968. And so um, uh, surprisingly, he, he kept it for many, many years. He said it didn't run right and that it lost time. And so he sent it back to the factory multiple times and they switched out the handset. So the handset that's on there is not the original handset that came with this watch. Um, and I was really surprised when I started getting into watches that he kept this watch because he's not really a sentimental person. If something's not working, he'll just throw it away. And uh, he just happened to have this watch still, you know, after, you know, 40 some odd years. And so, you know, I got the watch and had it fixed and he wore it for a while. And then after a while he said, you know what, like, I'm not really wearing a watch anymore. You have this watch. And so this is probably the most valuable watch in my entire collection uh, from a sentim sentimentality standpoint, not necessarily from a, uh, a monetary standpoint. And I just love wearing it because, uh, you know, I think of my dad and, and, you know, think of the connection that he had with his, uh, with his grandfather as well. Um, I put on the, um, uh, beads of rice uh, bracelet that that's on it currently um, just because I think it, it really adds to the uh, to the vintage charm and mm -hmm. so yeah that's my that's my uh, I guess next pick this Waltham diver yeah, it's in good condition as well isn't it because it, it, it the stuff on the dial is just the way the watch is naturally patinaed over yeah. the age of it hasn't it but the case it's radiation the seem to be yeah, I think it's radioactive to be honest. So, so, yeah. so the dial is it like will be a little bit. Yes, it's that T on the dial. 
Yeah, there is there is a, I wonder if there is a T, uh, but yeah, it's like around the, the hour markers now, it's starting to like, you know, uh, change colors a little bit. And so, mm -hmm. you know, some of these radioactive watches will, will do that. Um, right. So, you know, definitely if you buy an older watch like this, you don't want to take it apart. You don't want to try and reloom the watch or anything uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, it might still have radioactive material uh, on it. But, you know, I don't wear it that much. And, and for me, you know, I, I just love looking at it more than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, excellent. Um, okay, so it might go, I think. Let me, uh, just go, let me go to this full screen here. Uh, next, next one, and Todd, this is uh, fortuitous. Is my turtle? So this is this is my Seiko turtle. In fact, one of the only original things on it is that is the dial. It's it had a bit of a, an overhaul, so it's got the NH thirty six in it movement because it had the movement was a bit quirky when I bought it, even though I bought it new. So Chris swapped that out, and then we had these amazing marine master hands and you mm -hmm. can't tell here at all it's a shame because this camera's not great quality but they've got a really nice bevel there's a guy i think is in holland where he just sells these marine master hands and they're incredible cost like 25 euros but in person they're just absolutely fantastic and chris uh timed this so chris who i do the casual watch talk show with and then also the other really cool thing with this is it's got that just the best quirkiest bracelet you can buy which is the uncle seiko razor wire super flexible um, as you can see i'm laying it down flat it's that flexible on your wrist larry uh, uncle seiko did just an incredible job on this um, bracelet but yeah this is my much loved turtle i couldn't agree more that this is it's t the skx is totally overblown for what it is whereas the turtle i think is understated this is the newer version of mine not the exact one but for 364 dollars the turtle for me is just the absolute standout the other thing as well which with the turtle is the sensor i use the turtle as an example for how to get away with making a big cased watch because the center of gravity is towards the back so it wears really nicely on the wrist instead of um like some squales and other big watches that you find where the center of gravity is towards the front or they have like a very thick sapphire crystal on it and it just pulls on your wrist whereas this very nicely sits on the wrist so right and i think it's a 44 millimeter watch but it lug to lug is less is is fairly compact and so mm -hmm. even if you have a smaller wrist like my wrists are are kind of flat which works out okay but they're not really they're less than seven inches and i could wear the turtles just fine yeah i think it's almost square in shape yeah, right almost square you're right i think it's like yeah, 46 so and 44 or something right. like that so that that's why you can't you can't look at you know, I, I think one of the most overrated uh, things about about looking at watches is, you know, what is the diameter? Like mm -hmm. everyone focuses on the diameter. It's all about lug to lug. Honestly, yeah, if lug to lug. Short lug to lug. You can have a six inch wrist and wear that comfortably. And mm -hmm. and so yeah, if you're thinking yeah. about buying one of those watches, totally do it. And I think you'll be surprised at how well they fit just about any wrist, whether it's big or small. Yeah, hundred percent. Todd, what's your what's next on your list? All right, let's um, let's mix it up again. So uh, let's put uh, put the uh, Seiko sixty one thirty nine Pogue, the one with the air temp dial. Oh yeah, I was interested in this one. We sent over the. Yeah, I should have probably okay. It does zoom in pretty well. So I again in my effort to come up with watches with cool stories, and so I'm looking at it. You know, it's right here. Um, so this is the story on that. So Spencer Klein was having, you know, one of his, uh, you know, mail calls or, or was doing a watch review, you know, something he was restoring for a customer. And he was showing, uh, that's right, that's what it was. He was showing the customer, uh, you know, had the watch in, but the dial was, I think there was a problem with the dial and something. And so he had a number of dials sitting on his bench as part of his filming. And this dial was on his bench. And I was looking at it and I was just enamored with the idea that somebody actually had done at least a prototype uh, corporate watch in a Seiko 6139. And I've never, ever seen one 
up until that point. Now, since then, actually, I found a Dr. Pepper watch. I even bid on it. Somebody had a gold dial 6139 with a Dr. Oh. Pepper logo. And unfortunately, it went for silly money. And so I, I, I bowed out. I'm like, I'm, that's not worth it. But this, he just had a dial and it was brand new. It was never put into a watch. And it's an authentic Seiko dial because it has the right date code on the back. And so it wasn't just an aftermarket dial. This is an authentic Seiko dial that somebody did the silk screen for Air Temp Corporation. And I said, I, I emailed Spencer and I said, hey, would you like to sell me that dial or trade for it? Anyhow, I traded him a blue dial out of a project watch. And then I took some watch parts and I had my uh, watch restorer, my, my good buddy, John, down in, um, in Arlington, Virginia, put the watch together for me out of parts that uh, I had from a parts watch and this new dial. He rebuilt the movement. It keeps incredible time. Uh, and it's just a really neat story. And then I, what, what I did is I called up Seiko and I found, talked to Seiko USA, talked to Seiko in Japan, trying to find out the origins of the dial and never was able to completely find where it was done. It was probably done here in the U S maybe in New Jersey, cause Seiko has a big New Jersey location. And, and the, the guy I talked to at Seiko USA, there's a special operations that Seiko has currently that they'll do custom watches. They'll do custom dials. And so if you have a corporate event or if you want to spend some money and have a wedding party, you can get your wedding party all the same watch. You can say, you know, Bill loves Gina on the dial or something like that. And it'll be the memento for the wedding. Uh, you can do whatever you want. You can buy one or you can buy, you know, a hundred or whatever the number is you want. It has to be out of the current Seiko catalog and it has to be certain dials. It has to be a larger watch because in order to print something on it. And so the history of the AirTemp Corporation, just real quick, you see the Chrysler symbol. So uh, AirTemp was born out of Walter Cry P. Chrysler's um, you know, corporation to you know, do HVAC for the Chrysler building. So the Chrysler building in New York City, AirTemp was the one of the first jobs it did. Uh, so for his own building in New York. York City. And ever since mm -hmm. then, if you go back in time, you can see AirTemp did, uh, it did uh, HVAC for, for, you know, U.S. Army tanks. It did it for aircraft. It built all the HVAC for Chrysler cars, et cetera, et cetera. And on up to, uh, it actually had its best years ever in the late 60s, early 70s, which is where this watch dial, I had, a, I had the right case back found. So the case back matches the dial in both the, both the models. So you can see there's two lines under Seiko chronograph automatic this is a 6002 and the date i have on mine is from 1973 april 1973 and the dial is april 1973 so it's actually mm -hmm. what seiko would have built had they built this watch and uh, um it looks like the right after that air temp um was uh, bought by another company and then it went out of pretty much went out of business it was kind of run to the ground uh, during the 70s and early 80s. But actually, the AirTemp Corporation does still exist, the name. Uh, somebody owns the name, and you'll still see AirTemp things out there. So my best guess is that this was prototyped to be some sort of award watch, corporate award watch. Yeah. But it was never built. So I have the only Chrysler AirTemp watch in the world, I think, um, because I don't think it was ever built. This looks like it, it's a very high-quality silkscreen. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, and the dial is brand new. So the watch is, uh, just very attractive too. So anyhow, that's kind of my story of hunting down the history of the Airtime Corporation, calling up Seiko, Seiko Museum in Tokyo and other places like that, trying to find out, you know, how was this dial made? Where was it made? And that sort of thing. So most likely here in the U S it was a custom job that just never actually got built into a watch. So, so they they, may, maybe that dial was just uh, like a sample or something. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. They probably were thinking, let's do this. And maybe for whatever reason they didn't. But at about the same time that dial was made and everything else is when the company got sold. So my guess is that that's what happened and, and just never, never got built for that reason. I, I find it interesting that they would have this custom made dial for a Japanese watch. You, you think about Chrysler and it's, such an American brand. And, you know, especially at that time, the, the Japanese auto industry was such a threat, you know, I mean, I don't, you know, and I don't know yeah. if that has anything to do with it. Did they show a sample to someone and they said, why are you putting this on a Seiko watch? Why not put it on a Bulldog Seiko watch? Right. Some other brand. Yeah. So that's right, really right. interesting, but I, I've never seen another co-branded, uh, you know, 6139 before. So the fact that you have one and that you've seen another one, I think is super interesting. I, I didn't even know that they existed at all. Yep. I didn't know it until I kind of saw it. Fun stuff. 
as cool. Cool. Steve, you'll go, I believe. All right. So my next pick uh, is going to be uh, something, you know, most of what I have already is, uh, uh, you know, kind of traditional classic design. So I went with a Zenith Defy mm -hmm. open work. Um, why did I go with this? Because I don't have anything else in my collection that looks like this. And it was just so, you know, um, I don't know. I feel like it looks really futuristic. I feel like it looks very classic at the same time. It's kind of got this Genta, you know, shaped um, hexagonal case, um, you know, and, and sort of this integrated style bracelet, even though it isn't an integrated bracelet, it's made fully out of titanium uh, with an in-house movement, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, I don't know, I guess, I guess I just, you know, wanted something that just looked totally unlike anything else I would have in my collection. So it's not something I wear all the time, but I just really enjoy wearing it the times that I do wear, wear it because it's such a statement piece. And, and, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, it, 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 it really, uh, you know, when people see it, they always love to comment. And I think, you know, everyone, I think deep down wants to have a skeletonized watch. I mean, they're, they're just so cool. You, you want to see the internals, you want to be able to see, you know, how it works and, and, you know, the gears moving and something like that. And so, um, yeah, I just kind of took the plunge on this and, and honestly for about the first six months, I thought I would sell it because I had it, uh, I had the bracelet size too loose and mm -hmm. the, the inside of the uh, bracelet is super sharp. And so it was extremely uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so just on a whim, I decided to wear it as tight as I, I possibly could. And wearing it as tight as possible actually made it feel very comfortable. So now I've figured out how to wear it. Uh, it was not a fun watch to size, but luckily I don't hopefully have to do that again. Uh, but yeah, really happy to, to own it. And, and Yeah, that is some, yeah. some high... You're kind of touching watches. some high heroic. I think they're a great value for me and some alternative to you know, right standard there. Lex. Yeah. 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 It's I mean, that is, that is really exquisite looking. watchmaking. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Just incredible. And it's it's still a current model, isn't it? That one. It's in it is. Yeah. So I, I bought it new uh, maybe two years ago. And I think it is, uh, they do have a few different variations of it. Like, and, you know, you can get it coated in white and coated in blue and you can get it with a, a leather strap or you can get it with the, um, with a rubber strap as well. And, and, uh, I, I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to go with the full, full metal bracelet. Cause I just think it's the most, um, striking, uh, version of this watch. And so that's, that's the, uh, the one that I chose and yeah, it's just a really, really cool piece. So glad to own it. Yeah, and that's the El Primero movement, right? But without the chronograph. Uh, that's a good question. That... I, I'm not. I'm not sure if it's if it's the the El Primero. I'll have to research that. But mm, the, yeah, or, or maybe I, someone I on the chat knows. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks for that. I'll go. I'll go next then. So my next one is one of my favorites. I went through a bit of a quartz phase earlier in the year, and I'm glad I did because this one. I absolutely love it. Can't see it very well there, but this is the the Breitling B1 from the nineties. Uh, just, I think this was the last where they were a decent size. So I think this is forty three or forty four, but it re wears really well. Has that super loud alarm. I do have it on the bracelet, but I like to wear it on this rubber strap. I I love this. I ended up getting two, um, one that had like a military insignia on, on it, but the dial was very badly damaged. So I ended up just selling that on to somebody else who's going to replace it. But I, I can't find, there's no current detail on it, but you can pick them up on Chrono 24. I think if you could get one around 1500 to $1,700, I think it's a great buy. Mm -hmm. The only problem with these that you've got to check if you are interested in getting one is that the module inside is apparently brutally expensive. Uh, if, it, there's a lot of forums where it quotes like $2,000 because they can't, Brightly wow. say it can't be repaired. So you've got to check the backlight because the backlight can go on them. Mine is pre, after, after this model, similar case shape and everything went to thermocompensated quartz, but this one is amazingly accurate mm -hmm. but they went even more accurate with the thermo compensated quartz so it doesn't have that fluctu fluctuation in temperature but yeah absolutely love this brightling and it's it's one of those watches that 
I, I review a lot of watches, obviously, on the channel, and I've seen a lot of like Rolexes and stuff like this. But this is the one of those ones where, when you put it on the wrist, you feel like I, I don't know. It's weird. It just makes me feel like I'm wearing an expensive watch, like a luxury watch. The bracelet, which I should have bought, is this weird asymmetric thing, but it's really comfortable. Yeah, so that's my little Breitling B one there. Big fan of that. I like it. I, I think it's All like, right. you know, one of the, uh, you know, Breitling's kind of new signature models. You know, you, you think about, mm -hmm. you know, kind of what Breitling has done and, you know, they're kind of trying to redefine what their heritage is and, and what their current lineup will be. But, you know, I definitely think these any digi models, um, you know, are, are very, very much like a Breitling specific thing. Uh, you know, Seiko's done it as well and some other brands have done it, but, but, you know, I, I think that it, they're they're super cool and, you know, probably undervalued, to be honest. Like, you know, I think a lot of people are, are passing them up because they want, you know, a, a mechanical movement. But, you know, a great way to get into a brand, uh, you know, at a, at a, a you know, fairly affordable price point and, um, you know, possibly a model that will appreciate some years down the line as well. Yeah, I, yeah when I was at so. Sam's house visiting him, I tried it on along with his, he had the X33 at the time too. So I always wanted to try on, I'm a mega guy too, and I always wanted to try X33. I was very disappointed in the X33. It did not, it it was one of those things you put it on, it was just, I don't know, it felt like my Iron Man Timex. It just didn't, <laughs> you know, it it just didn't do anything for me, but I put on the bright lane that, that he had. And I was like, okay, this is much more of what I would expect from an anti digi watch. It had some, I don't know, it had some mass to it. It had, I don't know, there was something about it on the wrist, like like Sam said, that really made the difference. Yeah, I've cool. still got that X33, but I've uh, been trying to sell it. Todd, next up, what are we, next what, up for what me. we got from you next Let's up? bring up the, uh, yeah. speaking of Omega, let's bring up Omega. So, okay. Yeah, so this oh, yeah. this is um, so in my humble opinion, this is th the most beautiful panda dial watch ever made, and that's my opinion. But uh, <laughs> this is the uh, so so in the reissue that Omega did with the CK two nine nine eight, which is after Wallace Sierra's original CK two nine nine eight that he wore in the early sixties. So this was the first. Technically, I think this was the first Omega in space. Now, Omega, of course, released a model that was the first Omega in space, but I believe the CK2998 was. And this came out in 2016 and 2018. The 2016 is is the uh, kind of the bluish dial. And the 2018 model, which is what this one is, is the silver with the red sweep. And uh, and they look blue. The picture, again, doesn't do it justice. I, I, if I could take better pictures, that would be great. Uh, the, the, it's really a kind of a black sub dials, but they almost are, are blue. And, um, it's, it's the 39.4 millimeter, just under 40 millimeter case. So it's the same size as the first Omega in space, same case, uh, design, twisted lug case design. And it's just, just a stunningly beautiful watch in my opinion. If I were to say, you know, there's no date complication. I know, I know you really like that, um. Sam, but, but in terms of symmetry of the dial, in terms of mm. just the least amount of riding Omega Speedmaster, um, just, uh, and the pulsation scale is actually rather useful. <laughs> it could be more than maybe a tachymeter these days. And it keeps, it's the 1861 movement. In fact, it's, it's probably really the 1863 movement. So the uh, Sapphire Sandwich Omega has the decorated movement, and this is probably the decorated movement. I've never pulled the case back off, so it has a solid case back, so you can't tell. But it, it, it fits. It just fits uh, your wrist. Just I'm looking at it here. Here's the, um, it has, uh, you know, it has the hippocampus, uh, you know, standard moon watch hippocampus. Very simple. If I can get it in focus here, and I apologize for the lights in this room aren't so conducive to this. I'll try to get a little closer. Where is it? There it is. This is, of course, a limited edition, too. Um, I seem to fall for these limited editions. This is the, uh, I think it's, what, 151 out of 2,998. So it's a low number. Uh, and when Omega issues the, the EC, put, they put out, obviously, 2,998 of them. So limited edition is kind of a question. At That number is kind of questionable. But... Um, this is my first watch I ever bought from Dean Bump. 
So I was going to go and Very get cool. a regular moon watch on a cruise going down to little Switzerland in, uh, uh, on the Island there. And, um, uh, I said, Hey, by chance, you know, I'm just going to swing for the fences here. Do you happen to have a, uh, this is, uh, 2019. Do you happen to have a, a CK two nine and eight? And he said, hold on. And he said, sure enough, somebody had pre-ordered one and never picked it up. It was sitting in the back of the safe in the store and he was able to find it and bring it up. And so, um, I got very fortunate to be able to get this. So I bought this new, uh, the strap is wonderful. Uh, and so anyhow, it's just a unique watch. And I just really like it for just its simplicity of function and uh, just the proportions are right. Just everything to me in terms of a chronograph uh, is done exactly correctly on this watch. Yeah, and Teddy Baldazar really likes them. And so, <laughs> and so he's been showing CK2998 a lot and I'm thinking you can't buy these new, you have to get them on the secondhand market. And if you go on Chrono 24 on these now, um, not to you know talk price too much, but some people want more than ten for them, and so which is a right. lot. That's a lot more than a lot more than I paid for. And so whether or not well, I don't know what they're getting for them exactly, but they are starting to go up. They're starting to follow like the tin tin, and a few others a little bit. They're they're kind of slowly following up there. But um, but yeah, it's just a beautiful right. watch. Well, Teddy must like it to uh, review it because normally he doesn't touch there anything that he can't flog you. There this is just go. just what I happen to be wearing today. It's the first Omega in space. So Todd, we're like Omega we are straight lug brothers or something like that. We we are just <laughs> uh, we are just together with Seikos and with Omega. There it is. Yeah, I, I'm totally cool. biased. I think I think those straight lug models, you know, are are super cool. It's a little bit different than the normal moon watch. And so yeah, I think I was kind of like you. I wanted something a little bit different, maybe with that symmetry. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I got I got this watch a couple of years ago, and and uh, yeah, I just happened to be wearing it tonight. So look at there, great that's fantastic. Cool, Steve. What have we got next from you? All right, so the next one on my list, and uh, you know, I don't think I'm immune from uh, movies or TV shows, and and definitely, you know, growing up uh, and watching um, uh, Top Gun, you know, and and seeing mm -hmm. those yeah. those PVD chronographs you know i think they wore like the uh orfina or porsche design um and so yeah, you know porsche that always design. resonated to me i always wanted a, a you know a pvd chronograph you know and and uh kind of feel like i don't know i'm i'm hot shit or something and uh so yeah i i you know i i'd been looking around for one for many many years i actually found one um that was basically a new old stock condition but i it it it, the bracelet wasn't perfect on it. And so I was always looking for something else to kind of replace it and just happened to come across this particular model. So Zen, uh, this is called the Zen 144. And this is a special PVD version that they made for, I think their 45th anniversary and maybe back in 2014. Um, and I just happened to get one of the very last ones I got off Chrono 24. Mm -hmm. It was uh, still brand new. And uh, yeah, I, I love it. I mean, Zins, you know, Chris obviously is a big fan of them. Um, and, 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 you know, for yeah. anyone who's ever owned them, they tend to be super over-engineered. You know, it's like way more of a watch than what you need. And so on this one, you know, it's got all these multiple adjustment points and it's got this AR dehumidifying uh, capsule on the side of the watch as well to let you have moisture, let you know if moisture has entered in. Um, you know, but I think for me that the, the main reason why I just really like this one a lot is just because, you know, it's just got that, the, those bright orange hands and the, the white markers. And I think it just all works together really well. And so, Sam, I know you're not a big fan of PVD watches, but I've always loved them. And so, you know, I, I had to get, I had to get a really nice one, you know, for, for one of my very first. Yeah, it looks in great condition as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's not scratched up or anything. Not I really, yet. I like the look of it. Yeah. And, and... Cool. Yep. Yep. I well, like let's... it too. Awesome. Well, right, okay. So well, let yours? me do my, I'll do, yeah, I'll do my next one. My next one, I'll be quick, uh, I'll be quick about this, um, is my CWC watch. Uh, the reason that this one's special is I wore this for years and then I gave it to my, father-in-law alec and unfortunately it came back in my collection in the worst possible way he, he passed away so it came back in my collection 
these, when I bought this one, you could buy them on eBay, hundreds of them on eBay, or you could pick them up at antiques fairs mm -hmm. in the UK for 20 quid, 40 quid. And then one of the great injustices of the CWC company, I think, is that these are like grossly overpriced now. I mean, to buy one with a tritium like mine, you're looking at £349, so probably close to $400. Uh, I think I'll perhaps make a video on this one day, but um, I'm not down with what CWC have done with this. I feel like they've taken an, a British institution and then they're just milking it for all they can. Um but that's a, a time. But yeah, just a just a real special one in my collection. Um, I wore it for years. It's got like a Hesselite front, rock solid. This this was issued. It was in the nineties, so this was one of the ones that was issued. They don't issue CWC watches now, except for I think to the SBS. But they're not actual active military issue. I think the British military issue ones now are citizen watches. So there you go. That's my little uh, CWC watch. That's nice. Awesome. Nice. What's I, the I love, what's, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. What's, what's the case size on that? It looks like a like an original Hamilton field Small. watch, almost size like a 34. Yeah, it's like a. Th I think it's a 36, but okay. it is small. In fact, I used to wear it on a bund strap. They do supply a bund mm. strap for it, and a big shout out to Stevo Straps, who I bought that Lim Land Rover, mm. the watch strap made out of the Land Rover tilt. He makes a very high quality aftermarket strap for this uh, bun strap that because it's fixed lugs and he has the like the sort of the screw rivets or whatever you call them. So you can actually fit it on there. If you've got one of these and you think it's a bit too small, they're not they're not too small. They're, they were an average size, but get those bun straps that he makes. They look absolutely fantastic. Mm. So That's cool. I, I just love hey, Todd. What's, uh... Uh, military watches like that 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 are just so utilitarian i mean to me that's just like watch perfection right there yeah absolutely todd what's next on your list then all right um last but not least so i almost uh so bring up the uh john blair special seiko 6138 oh yeah so i almost so, you know, like, this is this is a senseless plug. I think I had this on the last time, right? I almost had my, this is my brown bull head. Ooh, same mechanism, all right, which is a, it's its own unique design and, and, and interesting history. But the reason I decided to do this one um, is that, uh, so I, I pick up Watchmaker Estate stuff occasionally when they come up for sale and they, they have a good price or they have something in it. And this one was with some other watch pieces. It was completely disassembled. Um, and it was impossible to tell necessarily too, if it was complete, but the, but the estate uh, for the whole thing wasn't very bad. It was like, it was like a couple hundred dollars or something like that. So you might as well try it. What attracted me to it though, is I saw the dial and the dial on this watch, which again, I didn't photograph well, I realize is is flawless it is just gorgeous there is a slight maybe uniform i'm looking at it here you know as i stare at my hand it's a slight uniform patina on the sub dials but it's perfectly done it's a little darker maybe than it was new and the black and the seiko gold and the seiko everything is just like it came out of the factory so this most and you can see the uh rehot or, or the inside chapter ring for example the tachymeter you can see that all the gold on that is perfectly uh, put together. There's no pieces missing. There's no flaking. Um, the dial, the the loom on it is original. It's perfectly done. And so this must have sat in a watchmaker's bin somewhere for a long time. And when I got it, it didn't, you know, it wasn't complete. And so I went around the world of my usual Seiko parts hunt and hunted down the uh, the chronograph the chronograph hands the black ones those are original Seiko new old stock um, the I think I had to source the minute hand and the sweep hand I did have the hour hand uh, I had to source source the, the pushers uh, I had to source a couple other things and uh, my again my same watchmaker friend down in uh, down in uh, Arlington put this together for me and it just came out the the case is super crisp. The lines, the factory lines are just in incredible shape. There's no polishing. It's, 
still has its brushing on it. Um, even the back of the watch doesn't have any of the any of the slips from like somebody taking the case back off and slipping with the tool. There's no marks on the case back. It's from 1976. And the other thing cool too, and it unfortunately doesn't show up very well at all. I'm going to try to show it here, but the band, you can see, see the John Player special embossed on the band here. There's nice. a guy, yeah. there's a guy in uh, Germany that makes these occasionally. He just happened to have one up for sale. So I picked it up. And so, um, uh, so it has this uh, custom band on it that says JPS. It's made for this watch, and it's really it's a thick leather. I'm still breaking it in, and it's just a neat story in terms of uh, you know just yeah. taking a chance on something and then going around the world and like the hands. Some of the hands are from the UK. Other ones came from oh, I think it came from Greece. Some parts came you know they came from all over the world to put this watch together, and it's uh, now completely original in terms of or completely NOS Seiko. Um, parts and so it's uh it's just a neat watch and it harks me back to my growing up in the 70s and remembering the john player special race cars uh formula one yeah and other I, things. I, yeah honestly there you I go. absolutely yeah the the yeah. lotus i, I absolutely i love mm -hmm. that todd that i think that that's yep, by far that lotus my, is my just that, that you've got yeah yeah oh, it's just gorgeous and so the same that's where it can't you know all seiko seem to have nicknames that the nickname came from of course the colors on the jps cars and it's just a neat thing. It just reminds me of my youth in the seventies and such growing up and watching, you know, racing and stuff like that. Yeah. That might be a new obsession for me. That watch, it looks, it looks <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Cause I used to love that Lotus, the, those iconic images. Mm -hmm. Yep. It harks back to again, that, that, that iconic racing time back in that day. It's just mm -hmm. it's something that you can't do anymore with these hyper computerized cars that they're running around now. It don't, just don't have the same visceral response. I just don't get the same romance out of, out of you know what they do now compared to what they used to do with McLaren and Brabham and you know, all these fantastic cars from yesteryear. Yeah, that's awesome, Steve. What's uh, your last one? Let's have a look sure. here. All right, so my last pick well. is uh, another racing watch, although it's mm. it's more of an aircraft associated racing watch. So it's a uh, Breitling uh, Top Time 810 is the model. And this is one that I actually just picked up um, uh, over kind of my Christmas break. Uh, I found a watchmaker who was out in the hill country and he had this sitting around uh, along with one other watch. And I mean, I couldn't believe it when I saw it and hadn't run probably in 20 or 30 years, but I had to buy it and I got a great deal on it and, mm -hmm. and had it, um, you know, fixed up and uh, it's such a cool watch. I mean, not just because of the fact that, you know, it's kind of got that that reverse uh, panda layout, but mm -hmm. it's got that super cool AOPA logo on the top, which is for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. So, you know, if you're in a, a U.S. Uh, aircraft or uh, mm -hmm. pilot owner or you are a, a pilot, uh, or I'm sorry, an aircraft owner or a pilot, uh, you could buy these watches uh, direct from Breitling and they would have the, that, that kind of uh, uh, Pilot's Wings logo. Uh, on the watch. And so you'll see a lot of bright links mm -hmm. that have that those on them. And so I thought that was really cool. Um, you know, it's not particularly uh, common to find these models with that. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the fact that this one has that and, you know, also that kind of red uh, center sweep hand, um, I don't know. It just really does it for me. Like, you know, I think I'm a lot like Todd in the fact that like, I love, I, I love, you know, vintage racing and, and, uh, you know, chronographs that kind of speak to that, that, uh, era of, uh, you know, formula one and, and Can-Am and, and these other racing series. And so, you know, even though there is a, an aircraft association, I very much do consider this, you know, much like a, a Hoyer Carrera and the fact that it's kind of like a, a gentleman's, uh, racing watch. And so, yeah, I absolutely love wearing this one. Really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I really like it yeah it's yeah, in great condition as well isn't it the dial it is oh yeah that's gorgeous that's one of my favorite you're right those designs back then like that and this is a very clean one it's a um similar to like the first omega in space type of case there's not a lot of extra there and uh, even the reissue of these i think is quite well done absolutely yeah i mean i'm a big fan of breitling um, I, I think they make awesome watches. I think it's a very understated brand. Uh, you know, obviously a lot of people were buying them back in the nineties, but, um, you know, there's some really incredible vintage models out there and they're not anywhere near as expensive as say a comparable Omega or Hoyer. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, great, great brand. If you're looking to get into a vintage chronograph. 
Yeah, I've been bidding uh, in the past a couple times on some caliber 12 bright links. Uh, yeah. uh, so, you know, the slightly improvement to the caliber 11 and and the, the, the price appreciation has just gone up enough that it's I, I bailed on on continuing on them. But I'd love to get one one day. Yeah, I'd love a caliber 11 or caliber 12 Hoya, mm -hmm. like an Octavia or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible cool. story that around the mm -hmm. caliber 11 where they all came together and created that movement, Breitling and Hamilton and so on. Cool. Well, I'll uh, I'll hit my last one. And this is the, the one that I've been wearing the most. This is my, oh, there's the, there's the website for it. This is my Christopher Ward, my C60 diver. Uh, just uh, all I can say about this is that I think after all of the years of reviewing watches, I think for sub thousand dollar watch, this is the best value Swiss watch you can buy. Mm. Uh, I think Christopher Ward are doing some absolutely incredible things. Uh, it has this uh, light catcher case here. I've got it on their bracelet, which is fantastic. It's got the uh, a, like a diver's extension in it, which works really well. You can't tell on here because this camera's rubbish, but the blue on it is fantastic. The the hands with that bevel, just super machined bezel on there, ceramic. It's got the loom on the bezel as well. I think Christopher Ward are doing... I think they're the best out of all the ones I've reviewed. My opinion, probably the best value Swiss designed in Britain, made in Switzerland. Probably the best value Swiss watches mm -hmm. you can buy under a thousand dollars. Just, it's just incredible value for money. That's so I, I love I love Christopher Ward. It, it's so weird to me that the the only criticism people have about it is that they don't like the name or the text on the dial. That's the only thing people mm -hmm, call yeah. out. No one ever calls out the quality. They're always like. Well, I don't like the the way that the logo looks, or I don't like the the way that the name looks. But I mean, otherwise, I mean, they're awesome watches. And uh, you know, there's like a newer uh, super compressor style watch as well that mm -hmm. I think is super awesome looking. And so, yeah, they just keep coming out with great design after great design. Yeah, that super compressor they redesigned. There's no other company that I think that does as much innovation as Christopher Ward in that in the sub thousand dollar. And they have ones that they have Cosk ones that are around sixteen hundred dollars, but they're bringing out. They've got a Cosk Tide watch, which is going to be less than a thousand dollars. I just mm. interviewed Mike France as well. Really interesting about the. Uh, he was talking through the Cosk process, but the their innovation that super compressor. They actually bought a super compressor watch at auction, a vintage one, because there was nobody making a true super compressor case anymore for probably 40 or 50 years. They bought and reverse engineered this case. Uh, it's, it's just an incredible story of the brand. They, their pricing is based on this. Um, I paid for this, by the way. This isn't a Christopher Ward. It <laughs> sounds like a Christopher Ward advert. I paid for this watch. But they do that three times multiplier. They just charge three times whatever it costs them to make it, which because <laughs> because the rest is and they just say out oh, well that's because this is for overhead this is it, it, it just an incredible brand mm -hmm. like you say um steve the the whole thing about the name i, I know we i said to mike uh when we was interviewing i said i know us as youtubers don't do it any favors because we got super macro on there but it, it's if, if, if you're only seeing the name you, you're missing out i said it on the podcast recently but agreed I think they're great yeah. value. Great value. Yeah, I think they've um, they've gotten to the position now. They're no longer a micro brand, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, uh, they maybe like Bremont in some ways, uh, not at that level of price, but in terms of like an established watch company that's fairly new. And you know, if I'm looking in that segment, like you said, traditionally for me, especially I'm a Hamilton fan, so I would, you know, look towards Hamilton in that in that price segment. Uh, traditionally, but uh, Christopher Ward now would be something I would look in, uh, seriously towards uh, there, and then moving up a little bit more towards more expensive Hamiltons or Oris even, or some yeah. beginning Zins. You know, now I'm you know, so they're yeah. starting to play in some pretty heady, uh, you know, pretty heady uh, ballparks there, and uh, it's very impressive what they've done in a very short time. Yeah, their new um, 
the new Sealander range and everything, this light catcher case that they've developed that fits the wrist, um, fits the wrist really well. I was said on the recent podcast that I, I usually refer to watches as being um you can put any strap on them, but I don't think you can with this Christopher Ward because they've specifically designed the case to fit your wrist. In fact, Mike <laughs> when I was interviewing was talking about this, that he doesn't think that the watches should really be on NATO's because he, he, they've designed the case to fit the back of your wrist perfectly. So that's mm -hmm. why they came out with this new uh, tide strap. If you hang on for, I'm going to be doing an interview with him about this new tide watch and tide strap where they've, they're working with this company that takes ocean plastic and weaves it into uh, watch straps because they're very, um, concerned about the way that the oceans are being treated at the moment it's they're very concerned about marine life and plastic mm -hmm. in the ocean and things like that so they're trying their best from their sort of watch world and in fact the watch world in general does a lot i know Vea does its um conservation of uh, sea urchins and oris obviously do their sea conservation work as well i don't know whether does seco when it's they say save the ocean do, do they support a charity themselves with those watches or is it just is i think just they do a... i think uh, i think the save the ocean like turtles and other uh variants i think some money goes somewhere uh for something some seiko chairs or charities that seiko sponsors i'm not certain right. yeah they don't seem to make a big song and dance about it do mm. they maybe it's more so in japan maybe that they that they do it cool well there we go well that was uh, that was really fun that guys thank you for uh thank you for doing that coming to the end nearly of the live stream so thanks everyone that's uh watched really appreciate it thanks for all your questions that came in and comments we appreciate you watching and we'll see you next time on casual watch talk live thanks guys bye 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 <laughs>